Good morning. I'm Pastor Jeff Cantor, and this is Virtual Praise on the 6th of March, 2022. I invite you now to incline your hearts and clear your minds as we go together to worship our Lord Jesus Christ.
Lord, the temptations of the world loom large before us. We are enticed, cajoled, and sweet-talked into moving from lives of service to lives of self-centeredness. We need your healing love. As you resisted the temptations in the wilderness, help us to place our trust in you, that we may be strong in our faith and confident in our service to you through serving others. Amen. Our Gospel lesson this morning comes from St. Luke's Gospel in the fourth chapter. Hear these words. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone. The devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor. It has been given to me and I can give it to anyone I want. To. If you worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. The devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down from you. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. Jesus answered, it is said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished all this tempting, he left him until an opportune time. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. In a world which values gambling, risking, taking dares, Lord, we come to this time of temptation. We confess that we are often enticed to take the risk for the rewards, often financial, offered if you win. Just a dollar and a dream, and we hear the glory stories of people receiving great monetary wealth. Later, we discover how many lives have been destroyed by this grand prize. Forgive us when we hunger for the wealth and power of the world which is dangled before us. Move us from greed to gratitude for your blessings. Heal our wounded spirits and lives so that we may fully serve you. Prepare us for this journey of discipleship and healing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And now, my sisters and brothers, receive this assurance of pardon for our many sins. God will provide for your needs. Place your trust in God. You are not alone. God is with you always. The world cannot offer to you such abiding riches as the presence of God. Amen. This is the good news that we have received, in which we stand, and by which we are saved, if we hold it fast. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, and that he appeared first to the women, then to Peter, and to the twelve, and then to many faithful witnesses. We believe that Jesus is the Christ, 
the Son of the living God. Jesus Christ is the first and the last, the beginning and the end. He is our Lord and our God. Amen. Would you go with me now in prayer? Dear Lord, flooding our emails, screaming to us from television screens, crowding up our mailboxes, the offers for millions of dollars, the dream of great wealth, ravage our lives. Life isn't easy. We do have struggles. We have come through the season devoted to commercialization of giving to a time in which we are called to put aside the desire for wealth, status, power, and enter into a journey of faith. This call is not an easy one to follow. It is much easier to succumb to the temptations of the culture of greed. Obsolescence is built into our systems. Just as a new one is developed, it becomes yesterday's news. But God's love and power are never obsolete. God's presence is with us always, lifting, healing, restoring, encouraging us to move forward 
on the journey of service and compassion. We bring to our prayers today needs of others in situations which are difficult and sorrowful. We implore God to respond with compassion and care for these, our loved ones. Help us, O oh God, to remember that you are in the midst of these times, giving hope and love. Enable us to feel the power of this love in our own lives. Empower us to share this love with others. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Would you pray with me, please? May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing to you, O Lord. May your word be proclaimed either through me or in spite of me. I ask in the name of the living Christ. Amen. I want to read for you Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 10, beginning in verse 8. The word is near you. It is on your lips and in your heart. That is the message concerning faith that we proclaim. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. And it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all, 
and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. In some respects, I think this passage fairly well sums up the New Testament almost in its entirety. It lays out very clearly what we must do in order to be saved. And frankly, it couldn't sound any simpler. Just speak the words that Jesus is Lord and believe fully that he was resurrected on the third day. That's it. That's the sum of it. Now, in writing this letter, Paul has established basically two perspectives that I'd like to explore. The first is what comes out of our mouth onto our lips. And the second, of course, is what the true nature of our heart may be. I think it's fair to say that what comes out of our mouths is not always in sync with what's in our hearts or what our heart believes. Have you ever spoken without thinking and come to regret it? What we say can be uplifting or informative or despairing. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 15, verse 11, what goes into someone's mouth does not defile them, but what comes out of their mouth, that is what defiles them. Recall that he was responding to the Pharisees after they protested that Jesus' followers violated the food rituals of the Jews. This was actually quite consequential in that it is one example of how Jesus is defining the new covenant that we spoke of last week. So I ask you, why do we worry about what others say, but we give little thought to what we ourselves say? Sometimes we just get indignant. Isn't it our right to say what we want? Isn't that protected under the Constitution? Haven't we been taught that honesty is always the best policy? I think it's a bit ironic that Paul is the one making this point. Because Paul, in my view, is perhaps the most boastful religious leader one can imagine. He has been called a fraud because he admonished the Gentiles to be his followers, presumably in place of Jesus Christ. He's also been held up as the zenith of Christian redemption because of his amazing backstory of Christian persecution. He remained convinced throughout his letters that he was not worthy of the title apostle. So is it disingenuous for Paul to lecture others on what comes out of the mouth? Well, some see Paul as a hypocrite. Some see him as an arrogant self-promoter. Still others hold him in such high regard as to nearly ascribe divinity to him. I think that Paul was a man of such conviction, such passion, and such gravitas as to eclipse most others seen either then or now. He was indeed arrogant, but not for personal gain. His purpose was to bring Christ to the Gentiles. And that was rather risky business in his day. Remember, he was contradicting both the Romans and the mainline Jewish leaders. He believed what he was teaching with absolute total confidence because of his personal story of salvation through Christ. As for his tacit divinity, I think we need to take him at his word that despite our modern reading of his letters, 
He never believed himself to be worthy of the calling he received and accepted. There is a difference between thinking yourself divine, which is one of those accusations, and being so firmly convinced of God's grace as to not let anyone dissuade you from your call. That suggests that a faith lived out boldly is preferable to a faith lived in private. This is what I have been referring to when I talk about us worshiping boldly. It's time, my friends, it is time for us to be bold in our claiming of our faith. There is absolutely nothing worthwhile in timidity when it comes to faith. Now, the other dimension of Paul's letter is understanding what's in the heart. What does the heart believe? Recall that I mentioned that keeping our hearts and our mouths in sync is sometimes difficult which does not suggest that we should not be honest about what's in our hearts, even if there is a risk of someone being hurt. Proverbs chapter 15, verse 28. The heart of the righteous weighs its answers, but the mouth of the wicked gushes evil. Weigh your answers. Think before you speak. That's the fundamental message. Allow what you say to be a true reflection of what's in your heart, not what is coming top of mind that would make you sound erudite or, or uh, pious or any of the other ways in which we might try and build ourselves up in someone else's eyes. Now, I could regale you with wise quotes from scripture or from noted philosophers, but I really think it's sufficient to simply encourage you to be real. To thine own self be true. Remember that if we are dishonest about the heart, there is little chance that the lips will be truthful. And faith cannot be sincere if it rests in an untrue heart. At the end of the day, an honest heart is the key that opens the soul, making it possible for us to grow in our understanding of God's grace. And grace, which is understood, is the beginning of loving like Jesus. Amen. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, water.
Now receive this benediction. The journey has begun. God is with you. Go forth to learn, to teach, to serve. Go bringing peace and hope to all. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Have a safe and blessed week. I look forward to being with you again very soon. God bless.